Can I put the Nicholas Batum game in a little uh, perspective for us? Sure. Can you guys guess how many points he averaged this season? Oh, no. They said it during the broadcast. Yeah. Five points yeah. he averaged. Mm-hmm. You know how many times this season he scored double digits? How many? Guess. 82 games. If he's averaging five a game, he wasn't even playing that much. In fact, listen, you didn't just lose last night to Philadelphia. You lost to Philadelphia playing Kyle Lowry, Batum, yeah. and Kelly Oubre. Seven, <laughs> seven times he scored double digits. That's Another funny. fun uh, Batum stat, yeah. which is great, is right. uh, 20 points in that game. The last time he scored 20 or more points, eight years ago. Right. Against the Miami Heat in yeah. game one of the playoffs for Charlotte. I just want to re- reiterate one little thing. Yeah. He averaged five points. Got he it. hit six threes last night. He's capable of that. He is. You left out Not Buddy Not for eight Heald. years, though. He hasn't done it in eight years. <laughs> I did leave out Buddy Heald. These are yeah. all players Stugatz discovered were still in the league last <laughs> night. Are you guys aware? Well, Heald, I thought, was with Sacramento. Batum, I thought he retired like seven years ago. Well, you're, you... Uh, you stopped paying attention to Batum two teams ago. I think Heald had another stop. Heald in was in Indiana, Indiana for three years. Right. He was? Yes. Three years. Yes. Wow. But the, the best Heald stat is this one. Are you guys aware that yesterday was Buddy Heald's 85th game of the season? It was his 85th huh. game of the season. Huh. Because of being traded, he played extra games. He went into that game having wow. played 84 Bonus games. games. I don't think anyone's ever done that before. I don't think that that's happened before, even with all the trades in the league. And <laughs> there yes. should be like a most games played award at the end of the season. Well, he would like perfect he would, attendance. He got it right. <laughs> uh, but for all of that, for all of the load management and everything else, you've still now got injury problems that make the East uh, a lot easier for Boston. You had to miss Lowry if you're a Heat fan. I mean, that's what he does. That first quarter, it's like, okay, that this is your answer for Jimmy. You're going to put Lowry on him. Right. He didn't do anything last game. The thing is, Lowry no, no, didn't no. do you, anything, Stu. You no, look at the box true. score, and you don't see a lot of stats. But you know what? You can't measure a man's heart and championship pedigree. You know what? I saw a lot of missed threes. I saw a lot of air balls from him. And he was plus one. I mean, Stugat, did you watch the game last game? I did. They won by one. He was plus one. That's not what that means. Well, what? That's the I difference mean, I'm really just saying. <laughs> Listen, he gets in people's way. He plays defense. He hustles. He makes countless winning plays. I'm telling you, the Heat regret it. If they had Lowry on their team last night, they win. They I did mean, throw, was Terry. They did have him on the court in that final possession, and he did almost blow it. And oh. he finally got the ball out. Mm-hmm. They're moving on. Speaking of blowing it, it's a tie game on the road you have to have. How about not a half court violation? Well, that was a foul. That was a foul. It just blatantly please, was a foul. Please. Oh, Nick Batum God. pushed him. Like it is what it is. Tyler Hero didn't play well for the majority of that game. He was playing well in the final few minutes of that game. That possession was poorly executed, but it it just blatantly obvious and, and it's gonna come out on the two minute report. Oh, sorry, we messed up. It was mm-hmm. a foul, and right. okay. there's nothing you can do you now. Can, you had the ball tied with a minute this, left. But in a one ga- in a one point game, we could do this about a number yeah, of you things. Could. And one of the things we could do it about is you know how infrequently the Heat lose at not making their free throws. They lose by one last night. They didn't make their free throws. The way they beat you is they don't turn the ball over. They steal it. They drag the game into an unpleasant watch so it doesn't feel anything like Chicago and Atlanta. They're ruining offensive basketball aggressively by playing fundamentally well. And when they get their free throws, they make them better than you, except last night when they did not. Two things. Tyler Hero, sell the flop. Second thing, maybe learn how to flop from Embiid after this free throw because I don't know what happened here. He, like, fell awkwardly and the broadcast didn't even – they just blew by it. Uh, Embiid uh, flops as much as anyone in the league. I don't know. Blake Griffin retired yesterday, and he had that reputation for a long time, and James Harden had it for a long time. He learned it from him, too. Embiid on a technical free throw, though, falling to his knees because (laughs) – The rare flop. It's, you know what it is? Is when you when you let that thing go, you feel like it's a little shorter, a little I'm longer. Like, will please, it in. please yes. go. Oh, yes. Okay, I want it. Yeah. Real hoopers now. You will it in. Yeah. Exactly right. I so. mean, people surprised Batum can have that game or had that game last night. I'm sorry. Like, Batum is capable of having that game. He hasn't had it in eight years. I don't eight care. Years, Real hoopers know. He's right Nicholas about that. Batum can put up that game at any given moment. Not in the last eight years. <laughs> at any given moment. Uh, again, though, but in all of the given moments in the last eight years. He hasn't done it, but not, last not, night he did. He saved it. Not, right. He could have done it, but he didn't do it, but mm-hmm. he could have done it. Right. Uh, Sean says that Jimmy Butler is expected to be out multiple weeks for the yeah, MCL injury. Oh! 
I have a top five reasons the Heat lost. If you guys Ooh, want that, really? Uh, yeah, do not. The refs, Thanks, Dan. <laughs> why am I here? What's my job? Aren't I here to talk about the Heat? Isn't that why I was hired? Uh, no. no. Maybe. What am I here for? I don't know. Go sit in the penalty box. Top five. You're to do that. Go to the penalty box. Literally, I'm the only one who knows. God. Mm. Uh, yeah. Uh, what? You're the only one who knows. Go ahead and put up that tweet of uh, all that Jeremy. Ultimately, I was gonna get be out. Right. I was gonna be right. Don't use another microphone. He was I let you down there, right. Dan. I should have stopped him from using this microphone. Yes, sorry. you should have. I'm sorry. <laughs> you have a sick form of justice. Share sick me. application of justice. You know what would have never happened if we had a regular office and not an open concept? I would have never thought those cupcakes were for everyone because they would have been in Elisa's desk in her right. cubicle, mm-hmm. and instead they were just in the middle of the office on a table. Fair. Go sit in the penalty box. <laughs> oh man, criminal! You know what I should do to you? Go sit in the go sit in the penalty box, cupcake. <laughs> oh. Do you work for the Indy Star? That thing. We'll get to Greg Doyle in a Jeez. second. <laughs> Greg Doyle of the Indianapolis Star started uh, the press conference in the welcome of Caitlin Clark, kind of the way the Heat started the postseason. <laughs> <laughs> Just Lecherous? the worst possible, Lecherous. the worst possible way. But let me read Jeremy Taché. <laughs> Am I not here for my Heat analysis? Uh, he writes before the game, Tyler Hero is going to do the thing this postseason. I could feel it in my bones and how poetic that would be. He did the thing, all right. <laughs> he was not terrible last night. What? Nine of 27. Nine of 27. He is, hit some shots down the stretch. They asked though, a lot did. of him late. Yeah. I, I just think I'm not – yes, he was inefficient slightly, but I'm not going to criticize Tyler Hero. It's not Hero. slightly inefficient, Chris. Like the, it, the modern age of basketball – uh, it, it, Kobe White scoring 42 last night is impressive. More impressive is doing it on 15 for 21 and and yes. doing it efficiently. There are some uh, – DeJounte Murray got 44 points earlier this season on 44 shots. That's not a good game. It's just simply <laughs> – any coach in the league or assistant coach in the league will say that if you hold a guy to a point per shot – you have done your job defensively. And Tyler Hero last night had more shots than points. That is not – that he can get 27 shots and miss two-thirds of them is not a good basketball I'm game. I'm just saying I don't think he's the reason to criticize the Heat. Jimmy got hurt, and if Jimmy if Jimmy's not hurt, that game's different. Tyler played well in that fourth quarter. I'm not going to argue – you can't argue he was efficient. I'm he just hit saying, a couple shots. He, he, he was clutch late in that game. I'm, I'm not going to criticize him. Shots. I could criticize Bam more than him. But also – Handling the ball, he was all over the place. Getting around screens, he couldn't. Like, there was a moment where Nick Batum was on him like a glove. Oh, no. You and kinda... he couldn't get around Nick Batum, who's played 9,000 years in the NBA. I Tony think... said he could get around Nick Batum. I could get around Nick today. Batum on a screen. That's insane. Yeah. What? Yeah. He did say that. Yeah, we're going to let that. that guy talk about it. <laughs> that guy, buddy. I haven't seen you touch a basketball in 15 years. Get out of here. See That's ya. how we do basketball analysis? <laughs> really? That's it? You said you got hired here to talk yes. heat basketball, and Dan yes. kicked you out. Mm. Yeah, because that's become the bit of the show. Let's make fun of Jeremy for everything he says. That's the bit, huh? Go ahead and sit up. See you. Thank you. Oh, Good. Man. Go again, please. Thank you. Anyways, long story short is that if you're going to play point guard, you have to control the ball, and you have to play well handling the ball there was no other point guard for the Miami Heat that was it it was Tyler and then he had to also put up shots it's an impossible spot for him to try and do something but also he played kind of like a whatever game I do agree that we've learned what Tyler is he's not he's below Ty- uh, Maxi. like he's not an elite star Chris you're right he hit some big shots down the stretch of the game last night when they needed them because Jimmy Butler was hurt. I'm just not blaming him for that loss is what I'm saying we can sit here after they lose by a point and criticize whatever it is that you want. They lost by a point. What I'm telling you is they went on the road to play a game that would have made their path easier, and they lost it when defensively they got Philadelphia to play exactly the game they needed them to play. Philadelphia was terrible in that first half, turning the ball over again and again. Embiid being hurt, I'm telling you, I've watched Embiid a lot over the last four seasons. It's rare even now for me to watch a LeBron game, for example, and see the age on him. I could see it on defense. I could see it sometimes how he moves in terms of lumbering, but it can still be hard to discern age even on the the oldest player in the league 
It was not hard to discern injury on this. The MVP of the league was limited yesterday. The MVP of the league, who has a distinct advantage over Bam that very few have, maybe Jokic, very few have, did not take Bam into the post and abuse him, did not take advantage of the foul trouble that Bam was in, got himself into foul trouble. That was not one of the best players in the league last night. At the end of the game, he had the stat line. But that's not how Joel Embiid plays. It's the game you need him to play when you're going to eliminate him from the playoffs. I think actually the way Embiid had to play last night because of being limited, he was at the top of the key a lot. It brought Bam out. It actually hurt the Heat. It opened things up. They were driving, kicking stuff out. Like I no, actually but, think but that Chris, actually well, ended no, up backfiring. Nick Nurse, on Nick Nurse made that adjustment at half. He did. He talked yes. about it after the game. I, no, I yeah. understand the adjustment, but the Heat will tell you, fine with your adjustment. Someone other than Embiid is going to beat us. Go ahead, Nicholas Batum. Go ahead. We'll take our chances with someone other than Maxi or Embiid. And it's what happened. Like, yes, you are. You're absolutely right. Pulling Bam out of the key, getting him into foul trouble. Bam was not effective last night. No. And he deserves more criticism than Tyler Hero because he's the centerpiece of everything they do defensively. But they were good defensively last night. And, of course, Nick Nurse is going to have to make adjustments. And if Embiid and Maxi don't beat you, if I tell you before that game, here's the Heat's game plan. Embiid and Maxi are not going to be what beats them. You're like, okay. Yep. Sign me up. I'm the biggest underdog in all the play-in games. The Heat win, yeah. Philadelphia's won eight straight. They look great when Embiid looks healthy. They look great. They look like somebody who could actually challenge Boston, even though they've had no success against Boston. But not with him limping around. Not with him clearly diminished. That's where we're going to start the playoffs with that team. And the other thing that you had, you had an emotionally franchise, an emotionally fragile franchise ready to fold for you. Their crowd was booing them in the first quarter. They've won eight straight. That's the part that's just maddening. So blame everybody. Go ahead and blame everybody. Look at this liberal woke turd out here doing charitable things for other people. He's do, he's in the middle, Stugatz, of his annual charity bowl, and mm -hmm. he is uh, doing something not everyone is doing, in that every donation goes to help New American Pathways in what I'm about to tell you. It's a refugee resettlement organization in Atlanta. EDSBSCharityBowl.com is where you go. Uh, and it's real easy, actually. Our audience is very good about this. Just text the word Charity Bowl 24. Charity Bowl and the number 24. Uh, it Make it one word uh, to the number 91999. Our audience is very good about supporting uh, the causes around here. I think I've made that too complicated. Charity Bowl 24. I just called 911. Uh, Charity Bowl 24. That's one, one word. word, yes. The, the text number is 91999. Text yes. Charity Bowl 24 to 91999. But That's three nines. I have a lot to get to with Spencer. Well, four, technically. Uh, but there's a one after the first one. Yes. Uh, all of this, do I have to put one before the number? All of this can be easier, I the think. The plus. Uh, but uh, why are you doing this, Spencer? Just explain the cause, please. Uh, it is to support refugee resettlement here in Atlanta. If you don't know, the refugees we take in as part of our agreements with our international partners, they end up in American towns and cities. And there are agencies there that are helping them become successful new Americans and get them off to a better start in their new home, our great country, this land, the United States. And Atlanta is one of them. I used to work in that community and uh, long ago in a former career that I was not very good at. So this is kind of my way of uh, my apologia of just point people to this and say, please give them money, which they have for the better part of over a decade. So it's like charity bowls, like a bowl game. What are we doing with the bowl? Is there yes. anything? Okay. So glad you asked that. You guys Thank are doing you. this better than I do it. Okay. Yeah. An effective oiled charity fundraising machine the Levitard show. Um, what you're going to do is you're going to give an important number, a number that means something to you in terms of your team, uh, particularly in terms of a rivalry. One of my favorites is to donate, uh, you know, 5224 or 5220, which is the uh, score from the 1997 Sugar Bowl when Florida blew out Florida State. Yeah, I got to go a long way back to find a happy number for Florida football, but I do it anyway. 
uh, might give $2,008 this week in honor of our last ancient national title. I'll dust it off for this week. That's happy. You pick a number that matters to your team, and that is what you donate. Post it publicly, rub someone else's nose in it, and then hopefully they respond in kind. You should go for some smaller numbers, you know? I mean, just... It, you know what? That is a valid point. Thank it you. could be 2008. It could be... Listen, you could do a number, like I'd like you could do... You could even do a middling receivers numbers. If you got a guy who's got like 400 and 38 yards, a four dollar and 38 yard donation is as welcome as a four hundred. You're basically you're you're saying make sports jokes and razz your friends and speak the language of sports intimacy where you insult your friends and you do a nice thing for a good cause. EDSBSCharityBull.com or you just type in the numbers, Stu Guts. It's easy. Nine one. Nine nine nine, mm -hmm. and you text the word one word charity yep. bowl and the number twenty four. Yes, uh, that could all be easier, Spencer. But thank you for the work that you're doing. I want to explain uh, to the audience here uh, because we did this earlier in the week, and I want to bring it to you. Uh, I want you to tell me what you think this sound is that we're about to play for you. All right. <laughs> Gonna get it one more time. <laughs> Uh, that that sounds like a goat being shot into space. <laughs> right. Yeah, I'm gonna go with I'm gonna go with goat astronaut. It is Mike Tyson sprinting. <laughs> I thought it was Sue God saying superfluous. <laughs> superfluous. I, Dan, what was the last time you sprinted? Like, like you're, you're over, you're over 50 now. I am correct? 55. I'm going to say I sprinted two years ago. Okay. It didn't feel good. Did it? No, it did not. No yeah. sprinting on the beach, but I did not make that noise. And you would have. Well, some, you, if you've been going as hard as Mike, yeah, you're going to make a weird noise. Somebody's writing in here. I was walking down a long dark hallway and Lebetard show played the Mike Tyson running sound out of nowhere. I had a heart attack. <laughs> Can you? I'm a, uh, by the way, bold move making fun of Mike Tyson for anything. If that, if I, if I don't know for sure that that man isn't behind me, I'm on camera and I still don't trust it. I'm not saying a damn thing about that man. It's hard. Not word to, one. It's hard to explain. I think an entire generation of people are going to arrive at a 57 year old Mike Tyson, see something sad there instead of what you and I see there, which is someone to be feared throughout eternity, forever. Absolutely forever. If you want to look up the craziest thing in the world, go on YouTube and, and search Mike Tyson versus Mitch Blood Green. That's right. A boxer named Mitch Blood Green, who was at one point, I believe, an actual street gang leader. And it's scary because Mike doesn't knock him out. Mike just beats him up. And it's worse than a lot of his knockouts because by the third or fourth round, you're like, I just wish this man would go down for his own safety and his own good because he eats some of the worst shots you will ever hear. I didn't say see. I said, "Here, they're horrifying." I believe that he fought Mitch Blood Green outside of a haberdashery at 4 a.m. in Harlem. <laughs> he did. It he was jumped out of a limo that Walter Berry was in. Mm -hmm. <laughs> two part fight. Two part fight. Once in the ring. Once in the street. Yeah. But he's 57. Mm hmm. Yeah. I don't care. He could be 75. <laughs> Reverse it. That man's. That man is. That man's gonna whoop my butt at any age. He's, <laughs> Yeah, eat, make whatever noises you want, okay? I, I don't care. I can't believe I can't believe that man is going to lose to a Paul brother. Cuz there's no way, there's no way this fight will be up and up. There's absolutely no way. And not if he loses, correct? Take a dive? If no, if Tyson loses, it is all fixed. I can't I can't see. Have you seen the sparring videos? That's I know. reckless. I, a lot of people are formulating their takes based off of what they've seen Mike Tyson do and these most recent sparring videos. But I can mm -hmm. assure you the odds makers have kind of investigated this one. And there's a reason why Jake Paul is minus 500. <laughs> He's minus rigged. 500. Yeah. And you're out here saying microphones that Mike Tyson's going to kill him. <laughs> him <laughs> is a are minus 500 favorite. <laughs> Yeah, it, it's all mythology fear, and it's me ignoring and Spencer ignoring 57. <laughs> yeah, that's a big difference. 57 versus a dude that's in his 20s in his athletic prime. He bit a man's ear off. 
That man is not Mike Tyson. That man is not Mike Tyson. I don't care. I, 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 I watched that man take people's heads off as a child. It does not matter. I am going to uh, start a fight in here by pointing out to Spencer Hall that according to tax documents obtained by USA Today, Miami paid out $22.7 million in total compensation to Mario Cristobal in 2022, the largest single-year payment to an athletics employee at any private university ever on record. $5 million per win. Yeah, $5 million a win. I hope that they made that an ACH deposit and not a check because with his clock management skills, he's never getting to the bank on time. It's just, just going to sit there. He's hey. too busy in the um, portal. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> hey, it, it should be, it should be noted that, uh, that includes the buyout and taxes. And the key phrase there is private institution because mm -hmm. what Miami is doing right now is actually spending as the public schools do, because I guarantee you, if you were to compare that to some of the compensation in the public schools, it doesn't make quite the aggregate easy story that it's become. Yeah, no, I'm citing the rumor, by the way, that Miami is a public institution. We're just going to call it that just to infuriate them on top of everything else. I'll be like, well, it's part of the Florida University's, you know, the stated system. Come on. Uh, yeah, Mario Cristobal, by the way perfect example they need to keep him on for like 10 years because they will get an, a national title accidentally right they will kirby smart this they will just say you might be smarter than us you might coach better but eventually i will stack them so high that we can't fail oh. all right and, and you're honestly, not the god's ears pal all right that's that's it just don't fire your guy okay like, say whatever you want. I don't care. If, if Mario's listening, okay? You may not be the brightest bulb, okay? But if you stay on long enough, you're going to draw enough moths. That's how it's going to work, okay? That's the plan, recruit. bud. That recruit. is recruit. the plan. Recruit. <laughs> Become too big to fail. That's it. Honestly, you want to know what Michigan did? Like, Michigan just kept Harbaugh on. They could have fired him. They could have gone for the next shiny thing. But that man said, I'm going to recruit 310-pound linemen who are mean as hell. And one day, we're going to bust through that wall. We might only do it once, and then I'll jump ship and go take the Chargers job. Uh, but, yeah, we're going to do it. That's what Miami should do. That's my approach with Florida. Florida, are we good right now? No. Do I think Billy Napier is a good coach? No. Is he recruiting pretty well? Yeah. How long am I willing to stick with it? I don't know. How long have I got? I'm probably going to be alive for another 25 years. It, it'll happen eventually. Just keep him on. Any thoughts, because your music commentary is usually pretty high-end, any thoughts, I don't know whether you enter the fray on rap beef or not, whether you feel comfortable <laughs> in your position to talk about most recent hip-hop beef, or you want to sit that out? Uh, no, no, no. I'm messy, so I'll enter the fray. Um, first of all, Drake is boring. Drake has always been boring. Drake lives and dies off his producers. Drake has never said an interesting thing. Quote me a Drake bar that matters. Not one. Not at all. Oh, that's interesting. You have trust issues with women. Oh, wow. You did it all yourself. That's every Drake song. I did it all for my team, and I hate women. That's it. That, that's it. his entire, like, oeuvre. His entire work, his body of work is just that. I don't find him interesting. Do you want to say he can rap? I Yeah, he can rap. Do I find the character of Drake interesting? Not at all. Does he have good production? Yes. I hope he pays them a lot because they're the reason he's successful. I will never be interested in a Drake, like, rap beef, ever. Ever, because he's lost it from step one, because I don't find him compelling. Is it hilarious that he's currently getting dragged by Rick Ross, a noted fabulist and liar, even on the rap curve of I am lying about the things I am saying about? Yeah, it's awesome. Will it matter? No, no. The kids love Drake. The kids absolutely love Drake. They will buy whatever he puts out. So none of this will matter, and none of this will be a better diss track than Pusha T's on Drake. None. None. Push a T, push a T ended that for me. I do not know if you can ever construct a better diss track than the for, one. But for out. everybody, everyone says that was the end of all of it, that none of those guys can come back from that. But Kendrick Lamar is somebody that I think is universally regarded as everyone loves good writing. But not everyone loves good writing. Don't like, I, I will tell you this. Uh, the teens, the Preach. teens do not care about in their in what I have been heard, what I've been told uh, by both my son and his peers. We don't care for those old wordy rappers. OK, they like that's it. We don't care about them words, which I respect deeply as somebody who kind of is like lyrics are overrated. Like I'm convinced an entire generation of baby boomers 
and lead poisoning really led to them thinking Bob Dylan was smart. Yeah, I don't care about words. I don't care about words at all. Okay, it's vibes. It's they want vibe-based vibe rappers. Preach. It's yes. vibes. I saw Lil Uzi, uh, Lil Uzi perform at Coachella, and he said like seven words the entire time to his own music. Yeah. it's just vibes. It's just listen. They just they just want a good vibe. Does it go? And I respect that honestly, right? Like I am a Kendrick Lamar fan. I like Kendrick Lamar, but if you come to me and go, yeah, but did you listen to his words? I'm like, ah, like half the time, maybe. It's got to have a good beat. It's got to sound good of my car. It's kind of going to either want to make me fight or cry. And then if it doesn't do either of those, I'm not real interested. Does he want to sit it out? It's his wheelhouse, man. <laughs> Are your thoughts that J. Cole shouldn't have sat it out? That he, I J. Don't... Cole should always sit it out. J. Cole can sit it out for the next decade. I, I I am joining uh I am joining fellow sports writer Shay Serrano in the J Cole and Salmonex. That's a great way to go to sleep. You got nothing for him, Tony. It just sounds like a hater, respectfully. Yeah. <laughs> Having well an opinion, yeah. an informed of, opinion of hating everybody because... is not an opinion, though. Spencer's not like, I don't everybody. like this guy. I he sucks. This I like guy Kendrick sucks. Lamar. I go to sleep to this guy. I like Pusha T. I do not care for J. Cole. This is having a stance. If you invoke the word hater, by the way, you've automatically lost because we're no longer arguing on the merits. I've been shuffled into a bin, a category, as you, opposed you to saying- You sound like a Drake hater. I am 100% a Drake okay. hater. That's fine. Drater. I do not like him. You brought I do the not hater, find not him me. I do not find him compelling. In the What is compelling about Drake? Find me one thing that is compelling about Drake. What oh. story has he told? What beat is immortal? What bar would you drop and go, ooh, that's hard. Ooh, that's good. Nothing. I just flipped the switch. Flip. flip. Ooh. No, no one's he just ever said the that. No he, he just ever the done flitch. that. <laughs> ah, I misspoke. He misspoke. He flipped the switch. <laughs> Damn it. That's a harder. That's a harder line than any Drake line. <laughs> Thank you. Give him credit. He came out and did better writing than Drake or any of his ghostwriters. <laughs> slip. Slip. Again, I, I will tell fish. you, edsbscharitybowl.com is where you go, and you can just text as one Damn word. It. One word. <laughs> that hurts. That hurts, doesn't it? Charity Jeff Bowl Brings. 24 to the number 91999. Is that one word? I wasn't clear. Uh, it is one no. word. Charity Bowl and the number 24, all one word. And one more thing, uh, just so that people understand, Spencer, because you are somebody who's doing work here that not everybody is doing, and our audience usually does does pretty strong in these areas when they believe in the humanity of a cause. Why is this the heartfelt one for you? Because you said you worked with these people, and I'm guessing somewhere in there you saw where help was needed. Absolutely. It's one of those things where um, these are people who have been through a lot, a tremendous amount. This country is a country of immigrants, and I think one of the most important tenets across any kind of uh, ethos, religion, or belief system is hospitality towards a stranger. That's it. That the first thing that you should say to them is welcome and you should mean it and that we should help people who are here because we have the resources to do that. Even if your resources are, by your own estimations, meager, that any amount of help uh, or even volunteer work in your community makes an immense difference, particularly when everyone does it at once. He's a liberal woke hater. He is Spencer <laughs> Hall, everybody. Thank you. You can uh, also support. It's one of the best podcasts going anywhere. Co-host of Shutdown Fullcast. It is, uh, I don't know which one he likes most, the the football of Saturdays or the funny that Saturday produces. If you can only have one, you only get to choose one for the rest of your life. Uh, the content that Saturday produces or the games that they produce, which one do you get to, which one do you choose? Love of football or the love of football, a love of funny that Saturdays provide? Um, I will always take the football. I will always take the football because uh, without that, there's not much to it. Uh, he loves it so much, Stugatz. And he's doing it the old-fashioned way. So few people out there just love writing about the South and history through football. What a ridiculous path he has taken to caring about this dumb, dumb thing we do on Saturdays. <laughs> Thank you, Spencer. Thanks, y'all. <laughs> Thank you.
This is how fried my co-host is. He was just muttering before these guys <laughs> came on. He was just muttering under his breath, talking to no one in particular. It's almost 420, Danny. He's uh, he's keeps saying, Stack's not a Spurs legend. Stack is not a Spurs legend. <laughs> I said that, yeah. Uh, you, you did say that. But, I said it, but, yeah. So I'm just staring at him, and, uh, it, it, and I'm staring at him, and he's waiting to see what my stare means. And eventually I say... Do you think Jerry Stackhouse is coming on with Matt Barnes? And he's like, he's not. And, and I'm like, no, it's Steven Jackson. And he's like, well, why do they call him Stack? And, and then I started to piece it together. Right, very ST, slowly, right? it started dawning on him, the Steven and the Jackson. And then he's like, oh, yeah, he is a Spurs legend. It's okay, my bad. But Jerry Stackhouse is not joining us. Matt Barnes and Steven Jackson. <laughs> I had no idea your nickname was Stack, man. Yes, I'm uh, sorry. We, we'll get to the bottom of that in a second. But we are planning some special things this NBA postseason with our partners at All the Smoke Productions. You can expect someone from their crew on this show once a week. Amin's on Bully Ball Weekly. Matt Barnes is on right now with Pablo Torre finds out in today's episode. And we're going to have some live watch-alongs later in the playoffs on our YouTube channel. Be sure to check out all the Smoke Productions on YouTube and the DraftKings Network for all new episodes of All the Smoke every Thursday. Uh, Matt, you played for the Kings. The Kings knocked out the Warriors. The Warriors appear to be finished and dead. What is your summation of both emotionally, how you felt watching the Kings do that to them, and the finality of respecting something that for a decade changed the entire sport? Yeah, I'll start with Golden State. We literally were just talked about this yesterday, and we feel that the, the dynasty is over. And... Will they keep the core together to, out of respect and tradition and for what they did for the game and each other in the, in the organization? Or do they make moves to see how they can better this team uh, in Steph's last handful of years? So uh, from that standpoint, uh, kind of sad, honestly, kind of sad to just see, you know, kind of an end of a run. Uh, and then on the flip side for the Kings, I mean, a, a young and up-and-coming team, a very shorthanded team right now. Obviously, Kevin Herter out with uh, shoulder surgery. Malik Monk as, uh, out with the knee, so very shorthanded, but we're able to, you know, capitalize and, and get themselves a chance uh, to get into the playoffs as the eighth seed. So, you know, a tough game against the Pelicans. Despite Zion being out, the Pelicans have had a lot of success against the Kings. So uh, definitely hoping the Kings can pull that off and slide into that eighth seed. Matt, what do you think Steph wants? I don't know, man. It's hard to think. I know Steph loves uh, Dre and, and Clay uh, like brothers, and uh, you know doesn't you know no one on the planet appreciates those two more than probably Steph. But I don't know. It's up in the air. I mean, I, I could see both sides. I could see him. Hey, let's ride off into the sunset together. We've had a great run. Or you know, do I want to try to compete? You know, in my last you know few years. So it's really a tough call, and it, it, a lot's going to come down to Mike Dunleavy and and, and and that management to see what they do. Steven, what did you make of what looked like? Because I don't know why it's so hard for winning to be fun. Why Kevin Durant would leave there. I would mm. think that for eight years they would love crushing everybody, but it appeared recently that Steph was crying into his jersey when Draymond got ejected again. Can you sort of explain to us the volatility of relying on a furnace like that that wins you championships but is also – clearly unreliable in spots and there are times that you're going to feel like your trust is betrayed yeah and, and, and i know stuff feels like that he's uh the biggest uh fan of draymond he he, he talks so high about draymond when people try to demean him when he makes this mistake but i think at this point he might not say it but he's fed up too because he's been doing everything right for so long he's been carrying this team for so long and now you're at the point now where Clay is not the player he needs to be. Draymond is still being the defensive player, the help guy. But when you don't have a guy like Clay or another guy like KD on their team to help him, it may, it's, it's, it's a lot of frustration for Steph. So I can see him being frustrated right now and, and not having answers because he don't want to say, I want to win and move on because he's loyal to these guys. But then again, he's a winner and he wants to end his career on a good note. So I think it's a situation – a tough situation for him, but somebody has to make uh, some tough decisions. You guys were both good teammates and good leaders. You saw a lot of different ego-type conflict. Put yourselves in that locker room. How are either one of you handling Draymond? 
I don't really think, and I mean, to, to uh, for someone who was in that locker room, um, I don't necessarily think it, it, it it's handling Draymond. I just think it's it's Draymond as he continues to get older, and has these mistakes that that that, that you know we're all allowed to make mistakes. We've all made mistakes, but his mistakes are, are are starting to add up to major suspensions and 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 missing games. And they're a much better team when he's on the floor. So I just think I, I don't know necessarily if it's it's handling Draymond because he is the leader of that that locker room he is the leader of that team he is the heart and soul of that organization you know obviously steph is the best player but draymond is the heart and soul so i mean i think it's just respectful conversations that steph may have with them or or or, or clay or other guys like that but i think at the end of the day it, it's more self-awareness on draymond's part and i think personally he's starting to see it it may be a little too late for this core to uh reciprocate you know him understanding his importance at, at this point because like i said i just kind of see with what they have now, uh, I don't necessarily see them winning a championship unless they make a big move. But I think it's just more on Draymond. And I think as you know, someone who is, is, is friends with Draymond, I think he's starting to see that and really understanding that his actions not only hurt himself, but are really starting to hurt his team because he's missing games over them. Not surprising that Matt would object to the verb handling on an adult human being. But Steph, would your, uh, would, would, uh, would your job, would your analysis, Stephen, be any different on that, or would you have anything? Because you weren't afraid of a confrontation when leadership is required, but what happens when your leader is, you know, creating, I think it's one of the great teammate crimes, which is just not being available for your guys because you can't be counted on. Yeah, I, I, they don't have nobody to check Draymond besides him checking himself in that locker room. That's how I feel. When, we, when I was in Golden State, Al could check me, Mac could check me, I could check BD. Like, we had several guys to check each other in the locker room. I think Draymond the only one that holds that type of weight in that locker room. So, like Matt said, it's going to be Draymond checking Draymond because at this point, to me personally, I think more frustration is going to come with Draymond because his lack of production. He's not the stopper. He's not the B. He's, he's just not the player he used to be. He's not as fast. He don't jump as high. So the less the less he produces in the game, the more frustration is going to come out. And I think that's why you've been seeing it so much now. Stugatz is... I, I'm sorry. I have to. I have to just stop you because Stugatz's eyes just lit up. He got. Yeah. He got very excited. What yeah. did you just notice? Is someone rolling a blunt behind you guys? I mean, <laughs> I'm jealous. I mean, I want to be with hey, you so guys. So listen. So there's a guy named David who has what's your donut shop called? Mr. Donuts. Mr. Donuts oh. out here in Colorado, and he oh. saw that we we're going to be out here, oh. so he came and brought me and Jack like six dozen donuts, and oh. he's like, "Man, I was hoping to smoke with you guys." Oh. And we're like, we're about to knock Dan's show out real quick, but as soon as we're done with Dan, <laughs> we'll smoke with you. So shout out Dave and, and, and his donut shop. He brought us some donuts oh. and some good eats. And then as soon as we're done, we're gonna, you know, we're gonna light up with our guy. He's doing some prep <laughs> while the interview's going. That's great. Swish a swing <laughs> backward, Dutch master would be like Chris Cody oh, got shit. more excited by the donuts. Than Working the for the blogs. wrong crew. <laughs> Can I you guys need a producer? You guys good? <laughs> Last night, uh, uh, oh the Miami God. Heat. I'm sorry, I did interrupt you, Matt. Did you want to continue? Oh uh, yeah, I just thought? wanted to add re just real quick. I don't like that people are trying to take shots at Steph and Steph's leadership uh, because of what Draymond is doing. And and again, everyone is their own man, and, and and sometimes you need to try to hold certain people accountable. But I don't think this is a knock on Steph's leadership or Steph as a teammate or does Steph have control of the locker room? Again, Draymond is a unique person, a unique player. Uh, to know, to really know Draymond is to love Draymond. And, and like I said, it's more self-awareness than anything. But I just don't like how people are trying to take shots at Steph's leadership over, you know, Draymond's mishaps. So that's I just wanted to add that before we got out of that subject. Well, I, I wanted to clarify and get some extrapolation from you guys on something. I think, Matt, that you revealed the story recently of Shaq doing something to Lou Admonson that I thought <laughs> should have resulted in an immediate prison sentence. Uh, <laughs> I, 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 I believe it was on Paul George's podcast that you told yeah. the story of Shaq running around for a practice with Lou Admonson's uh, mouth guard uh, underneath or around his testicles i'm not sure exactly oh, where matters it matter? but it's it's <laughs> one, I, I first of all i can't imagine someone doing that to either one of you two okay i cannot imagine someone uh having the literal sweaty balls to do that to you two but that's not okay guys like there's nothing about that that's okay no absolutely not, not at all 
Absolutely not. There's there's nothing that okay's that. But uh, again, Shaq, you know, you're talking about two big personalities. We, we go from Draymond to Shaq, and Shaq is Shaq, seven foot, three hundred sixty plus pounds. And at that time in in Phoenix, you know, obviously on the backside of his career, but I I still credit one of the funnest seasons I've ever had, just because he was in that locker room. And although he may have crossed the line at times by doing stuff mm-hmm. like that and chasing people around naked. Uh, Shaq was just, uh, again, one of those guys that really knew how to k- keep it light, no pun intended. And then also, obviously, when it was game time, it was time to go. But Shaq is just just an incredible uh, human, and, and, and he definitely did a few things to cross the line, uh, that being one of them. But uh, again, man, Matt, I'm going to stop you right here, and I want the thoughts that are inside Steven's head because he's shaking his head. <laughs> he's been shaking his head since I asked the question. And I think you're being very nice to, to Shaquille O'Neal. You're being very gentle with this. Again, prison sentence is what if I if I if I if I was on if I was on the bit excessive. If I no, it's not a bit excessive. It is not a bit excessive. If I was on a jury, I I would say Shaq. I know this isn't in the this isn't on the books anywhere. The rules, but this is a criminal sentence. I want your thoughts, Stephen. I mean, Shaq is a big bro. We all love Shaq, but a line would have been drawn. Big fella, you you running at me naked, and you know I ain't with all that. You get mad, tweaking ready. I'm gonna go to the car and get something to even this fight out. <laughs> I'm not gonna be running from you while you're naked. I'm gonna go and show you I'm serious, and you go play with somebody else. They go play with somebody else. <laughs> <laughs> what is the angriest you guys have ever been at a teammate, or what's the angriest story you've ever heard as a reaction to a prank? I think I heard one time Kenyon Martin was really mad because they filled his car with popcorn, a brand new car, one of his teammates, and I, I I'd heard that story. <laughs> what is the teammate story that you guys <laughs> have where you saw? A teammate so angry that it actually escalated to a to you know a, a, the place that Steven's talking about where he's going to his car to even things out. <laughs> I uh, I remember being in Indiana, and uh, Danny Granger had just signed with the team. We had um, the veteran Darrell Armstrong on our team, and if you know Darrell Armstrong, he's a serious guy. Black college, he takes basketball real super serious, and he's a vet. So Danny Ranger, Granger shows up to practice late. He comes in and Daryl Armstrong was like, you're a rookie. You have to be early. He told him to, you know what, to his private place. <laughs> Daryl Armstrong got off the bike and went half court and maybe two steps <laughs> and hit Danny with a Mike Tyson 21-year-old punch. <laughs> and Danny was early. <laughs> For the rest of the season. <laughs> <laughs> just like that? Like, just walked right up to him and just hit him? If you know uh, Darrell Armstrong, he don't play. Different times. <laughs> different times. That was good. Uh, my story, my story. I remember really my first NBA practice. You know, I get drafted. I got cut, go to the G League, get called up by the Clippers. This is back in the, the, the Sterling era, practicing that South by Southwest, where you had to leave the back door open so your car didn't get broken into. My very first <laughs> practice, I, when I walk into practice, uh, uh, Quentin Richardson and 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 uh, Keon Dooling are in a, a real fist fight, like a real fist fight. You know, Quentin Richardson's a big old bear, and obviously KD, you know, was quick on his feet with a nice little jab. But I, my first NBA practice, I'm walking into two guys that were friends, and we're friends after that. But really, it just put them up and, and squared up, and we're and we're really fighting. I was like, oh, this is what the NBA is about. I'm gonna be all right. I like I've never this. understood that about your environment. I feel like in our, in our environment, if any of us got into a fist fight, that would probably be the end of our relationship. <laughs> Facts. <laughs> I agree. I've never had a fight with nobody I'm friends with. I, I, I don't understand what it is about uh, your environment. I, I remember Ray Allen talking about this one it's time. It's competitive, Well, but Yeah, but it's just, you also <laughs> can't be in your feelings. Like, it's just not... It's not a place that tolerates you being fragile about your feelings. And and if there's a fight, I would think that's something that I would remember. I'd have a hard time working with that person later in the day. Mm-hmm. I guarantee Kenya Doolin and Quit Rich don't talk today. Oh, probably not. But 
They was cool the rest of the season. They was cool. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I didn't know that. They just that, got through the season. That's what the rules were. I don't know if you guys. I'm getting some criticism here because I was critical of Bam out of bio, and I was talking about the game last night, and Tyler Hero was taking all the shots, and Bam is a defensive player. He's the reason their defense is so good, but also he had zero free throws, and he took nine shots in the game. He made five of them. You look through his game logs. There's not a lot that's that kind of meek over the course of the season, but there are reasons for it so your analysis as you watched heat and sixers last night was what uh tyler had to do a lot of scoring and i i and i really like tyler hero but i think he he's he's still on a mission to prove how good he is i think he's been disrespected in the past and wanted to be mentioned in certain categories with certain caliber of players and i really like his talent uh but i think at times he needs someone to be like hey you know, you got you got some teammates here, you know, especially because Jimmy is a, a Swiss Army knife. I feel like the Heat are the best when Jimmy doesn't have to be the leading scorer. So that, that, that in tune, which makes me think, you know, Tyler does have to step up. But at the same time, you definitely need production from Bam. Uh, he's very talented, although he's a defensive minded player. He's definitely someone that can give you 18 to 20 points. If I'm not mistaken, that's kind of around his average 17, 18, 19 points. So as one of the, the, the you know the, the the best players on the team i mean i i think it's somewhere you pull tyler to the side during the game or even on the court and, and say give me that damn ball or you know let's run a set to, to to be able to utilize me because although mb was you know very impressive on the offensive and we all saw he's not healthy and he can't really move and i thought that bam should have been able to try to you know stretch him out a little bit and go by him but that, like you said to only get nine attempts and, and no free throws i don't think they were able to utilize bam as much on the offensive end as they needed to last night Steven, again, again, your, di have... your disgust is clear on your face. Like you're, <laughs> you, you, you were watching last night, disgusted. You know, you know, I, you know, I wear my emotions on my sleeve. Um, they don't have a, they have a defensive identity. They don't have no offensive identity. And Tyler's great, but he's not ready. He's not ready to carry this team and 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 be the number one guy for this team. To me, he doesn't have enough to his game to be the number one player. He's a great shooter. He's not strong, don't have a post-up game, not the best ball handler. So to to be the number one guy, especially going this part of the season, he has to be better. I don't think he's ready. Jim, Jimmy, you have to step up. They don't expect you to score, but these are the times and the games where you have to play big. You can't take a step back. Bam out of bio. Y'all don't have a point guard like Chris Paul or Rondo that's going to get you the ball when you now get the uh, ball four or five trips down. So you have to get the ball. Y'all don't have that point guard. Y'all don't have that identity as an offense to know where to go or get the ball to the guy who's rolling. They don't have that. First guy get across the half court, they shoot the ball. And that's how they played last night. Steven, is Jalen Brunson ready? Jalen Brunson is beyond ready. Yeah. Wolf, 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 wolf. Big uh -huh. dog. Uh -huh. I'm excited. <laughs> I had to come out and, and admit I was wrong because I remember when he first got uh, that contract, I just didn't think, I didn't know, because I don't think any of us knew, to be honest, that he was nobody, be as good nobody, as he is. nobody. The Knicks but didn't know. I just know. didn't say, yeah, I didn't say, I, I, I personally, I was like, I didn't think he was going to move the needle and put them over the hump and be, mm -hmm. I ate my words because he's been able to do that and more without Julius Randle. Uh, so I've been really happy for him. Uh, great guy, great situation. And, and to, to think at, at the beginning, people had questions. Now I think he's underpaid. Uh, yeah. Definitely one of the best point guards in the game. It's going to be tough to see whether he lands on first or, or second team All NBA, but uh, I think he's a lock for one of those slots. But uh, you know, very impressed with uh, Jada Brunson what he's been able to do. Is there anything that you question about the Celtics? Because I don't. I don't question anything about the Celtics, but people do. I like them. I, I think this is the year you don't question them, and I think it's because of Drew Holiday. Um, I think as solid as he is, when the team gets to going haywire and, and, and making a lot of mistakes, taking bad shots, I think Drew the guy that can pull him back in, get the ball to the right person, and get them going on defense. So I think if any if any year where they, where they have a great, the best chance, I think it's this year with Drew. I think the X factor is Porzingis. I think he's a mismatch mm. for bigs. Um, and, and his availability has always been the question mark through his career, not necessarily his talent. So I think Porzingis is going to be huge. And just the fact is, is Jason Tatum really ready to make that step? I think he's one of the most talented players. And I think he gets knocked and discredited because he hasn't 
won a championship yet. You know, he was there in the Eastern Finals as a rookie, you know, lost to Golden State in the finals. So I think everyone's looking for Jason Tatum to really make that superstar step. And I think for that superstar step is winning a championship for his organization. So they've been the best team all season. Uh, and I love what Jack said about Holiday. I think Holiday was a huge, huge pickup on both sides of the ball because he's someone that when there are lulls on the offensive end during the playoffs, he's someone you know can step up and hit a big shot. But I definitely think the key to this team is Porzingis his, and his ability to be out there because when he's out there, uh, he's a shot blocker and he's a mismatch on the offensive end. Amin Al Hassan, who was on Bully Ball with Rachel Nichols, uh, he called uh, Drew Holiday a corpse. Whoops. Uh, yes, uh, when he moved uh, teams, <laughs> at least in part, because Drew Holiday at the time, to be fair, had just been smoked by, uh, by Jimmy Butler in the playoffs and was talking out loud about quitting. He was talking about retiring from the game. But give me a guy like Drew Holiday, just off the top of your head, both of you, who both of you guys – respected so much as a teammate that you might be in the middle of hot, angry, that person comes up to you and now you're stepping back just because of the amount of respect you have for the person who's coming to you in that moment as a teammate, who has such credentials as a veteran and who does his job so professionally well that the respect makes you immediately say, you know what, I need to stand down here. Well, um, in Golden State, I think for us, it was Jason Richardson. Jason Richardson was the was the guy with the even kill on our team, but the guy that I remember the most was Steve Smith for me in San Antonio. Oh wow, that's old school. That's at the beginning too, right? So you don't feel like you know much of anything about the league, and this is somebody you I, I'm not going to say grew up watching, but but he showed gave me the ropes. How about you, Matt? Uh, I think Jay Rich was a great call. Uh, mm -hmm. Someone who was again was the, kind of the face of the team. Mm -hmm. before Baron got there and, and, and the rest of uh, uh, us got there and someone who just went out and did his job every single night, didn't say a word about it, slam dunk contest, big score, but never was able to get over the hump. And I think he appreciated what they finally did by bringing in hit us in some help. So, uh, I, yeah, I definitely think Jay Rich early on was what was someone who was very even keeled and, and kind of kept the pulse of the team because he had the longest tenure there and right. he had the most to gain, uh, you know, from the team's success. I'm going to throw this to the shipping container instead of them. What is the best of the donuts? Oh, wow. I mean, well, it's obvious. It's a clear glazed donut. Yeah, it's jelly. Now it's jelly. Original glazed donut. Sugar raised jelly donut. Not powdered jelly. Have you ever had a donut? Powdered. Donuts. You can just try it through and go get your own donut. I used to go pick up a dozen donuts and cronut. And then I go get jelly. I mean, great jelly, but it's got the red light on. The red light is on. There's nothing you can do better than that. Uh, Matt, your thoughts? That was a hell of a question you just asked. My favorite donut, I, and I just found a place in LA. I like the chocolate donut, but I also like the glazed bottom because oh, most nice. of the time it's just a regular cake and the chocolate is, you know, but I found a place in LA that glazes the bottom and has the chocolate on top. I'm a real donut connoisseur, so <laughs> that's my. <laughs> Steven, I, I don't feel Steven's a careful eater. He he doesn't. Uh, my mom's flan tempted him, but otherwise Ooh. he's being very careful. I love donuts. I'm a, a color donut guy. I like uh, is, the is red that, velvet, is that you're the colored? blueberry. Because <laughs> you're colored? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I'm <laughs> I, I, there, I didn't know there was a red. I, I had never, I have never heard a red velvet donut described as a colored donut. That's not, uh, yeah, yeah, it's red. <laughs> yeah, no, you know, I, you know, thank, hey, you. You, know, you, thank you. You know, we call, you know, we call grape Kool Aid and cherry Kool Aid, red Kool Aid and red, purple red. Kool Aid. Yeah, you know what I mean. We just, that is the we, kind we, of analysis you will only get from all the smoke. The elaboration of yes, it's red. It's a red. Red for sure. <laughs> Wait a second, guys. Back. Woods or Dutch Masters? Ugh. Neither. Wow, really? Switch Neither. What are you doing? Ah, uh, raw. <laughs> Is he an amateur? He's an amateur. He's no, I, I, I mean, I did swishers for like twenty plus years. I met Jack when me and Jack first started hanging out. We were both swishers, heavy, heavy, heavy. But just that, it, it sits on your lungs. So I've, I've graduated thanks to Wiz Khalifa to papers about eight years ago. Yeah, they oh, do. No backwoods. Yeah. I like the I like the tobacco wraps but no backwards. Mm -hmm. All right, I'm going to do this to uh, thanks to Wiz Khalifa. Look at me, Lou. <laughs> 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 <laughs>
just an unnecessary. No, I mean name he's right. Drop. He's no, right. No, he's a, right. It's an unnecessary name drop. He's right. Oh he's he's Matt Barnes. He's right. I mean, no, but it's unnecessary. Yeah, but he knows him. Like he I mean, could have learned it from anybody. He wouldn't have said like uh, 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 Jose, Wiz, my friend no, Jose. No, but Wiz brought it into the the, you know, the public sphere. Daniel. Exactly. <laughs> okay, but still. <laughs> Still, I, I'm assuming that he's doing it personally. It's not just because Wiz Khalifa is making it popular. I'm assuming he's smoking with Wiz Khalifa. No? Yeah. Yeah. That, yeah I mean, that's, <laughs> <laughs> he, 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 All right. I was wrong, Dan. My bad. He's my neighbor. <laughs> See you guys, my neighbor. Hit it again. See you guys later. Again, you can expect someone from their crew once a week. Thank you, guys. No doubt. Thanks for having us, fellas. All right. Oh, wait, wait. Dan, we still there? Mm-hmm. We're supposed to plug our tour. Can all we right, plug it real quick. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, all the smoke live tour. Uh, appreciate all the fans that pitched in. We asked where you guys wanted us to to visit, and the first stop will be Detroit, June third, Detroit, and then Chicago, June fourth. So that'll be the first stop, two stops of our tour. I think we got six more to come, but those are the first two stops. So get your tickets now. Uh, pre-sale tickets are available. Um, man. Come have a good time with us. Where where are they available? You want to tell the people where they're available? T tickets are where? Tickets are checkers. Uh, check our Instagram. All right, you got to do better Instagram, than that. Tickets are available. Uh, you're, you're they, you got to do better. Come you on. Did fine. Come, I mean, hey, come man, on, just, Barnes. You did we fine. We just got the information. They just got green lit. So <laughs> yeah. tick, go, go to All the Smoke Instagram. Yeah. Get your pre sold. Uh, yeah, and, 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 and go to All the Smoke Instagram. The commercial and the announcement about it is much better. Okay. <laughs> Classic stack. <laughs> See you later. Our thanks right, again to uh, Matt Barnes and Jerry Stackhouse uh, for being on the show. <laughs> this is the Dan Lebator Show with the Stugats podcast. <laughs> <laughs>